These incidents occurred over a period of time when I was younger. However, it was only until recently that I connected the dots. I grew up in Louisiana, right on the outskirts of New Orleans. The city itself has so much history, stories and intrigue surrounding it, that I would be remiss to say that I didn't have other experiences involving spirits and all that, but that's a story for another time. Right after Hurricane Katrina, I was displaced by the storm and ended up staying in Florida for a little while. While there, it seemed as though every channel on the news had coverage on the horrific event. People's houses were flooded, the roads were blocked, businesses were destroyed, and to make things even worse, there were many reports of people committing some serious crimes. Part of the news covered people trying to escape the storm and the resulting aftermath and the other half seemed to cover the dark side of humanity, vandalism, theft, looting, violence. All of that occurred while others were simply trying to survive. To make matters worse, the prisons were destroyed, and a lot of the city's unmentionables started roaming the area, causing more trouble for the people who were trying to survive. Some really, really horrible stuff went on, like, sure, this experience involved the aftermath of a horrible storm and the possible encounter with a dangerous cryptid, but I'll never put it past humans to be the darkest, most cruel creatures in existence. The news covered up a lot of it. Of course, this is where people began to say, then how do you know what really happened if there was a cover-up? And to you, I'll say this. I was there, in the Superdome. I hid from the prisoners when they broke in, and I, being one of the able-bodied people in the area, was able to help deal with the people who weren't as fortunate and being able to hide. Coverage about the swamps flooding, animals escaping the zoo, as well as creatures like the alligators and such, made their way into the same broken streets as the ones where people simply trying to get back to their homes. The news covered this as well. It seemed as though all manners of beasts were displaced from the storm. Not just us humans. But what about the things that we are told don't exist? Is it possible that the storm impacted them as well? A few months after the storm, I eventually moved back to Louisiana and tried to put back the pieces of my life. I lost a dear friend to people who were looting. My house was in shambles, and the majority of my classmates were off in different cities. Thankfully, I started dating my now wife, who is from Florida. We would take turns visiting each other every other weekend. It was a long distance thing, but we made it work. This is relevant to the story. Just trust me. One week, as I was driving my sister home from the movies, we started talking about lions. She was 13 at the time, and she had just got out from seeing the Narnia movie with her friends. We crossed a small bridge that led into our subdivision. As we turned to the corner, she said something along the lines of, And, and Mr. Mr. Tumnus started, started to play a flute. flute. What's a Tumnus again? I asked. He is this goat man thing. She saw my confused face and continued. He's got like the legs of a goat. However, he has horns and doesn't have any hair on his body. Like Phil, you know from Hercule. She paused mid-sentence. Ew, did Ashley get a new dog or something? and motioned towards our neighbor's yard. I glanced to the left and saw what looked like a grayish dog, sort of like a greyhound, sitting in their front lawn. But something about it didn't feel right. It was skinny, like a little too skinny. Its muzzle looked too flat, and its legs were longer than I thought they should be. But I wasn't an expert in dogs, so I didn't think much of it at the time. Um, not sure, I said as we drove past their house. But I'll ask her later. We drove off with it looking in the direction of my car. Almost as if it were following us with its eyes. But I mean, that's what animals do. And casted it off as nothing. In passing, I texted Ashley. Asking about her new creepy puppy. But she had no idea what I was talking about. She said it was most likely some stray that got a whiff of her dogs. Poor, Poor thing was, was probably, probably malnourished. malnourished. If it, it was, was as thin as you described. Describe. She said, I just wrote it off as whatever and forgot all about it. A few weeks later, I was on the phone with my girlfriend, 
just talking about our respective days at school. As I walked into the kitchen to grab a Coke, Robin, my sister, was browsing her friend's MySpace page and listening to Lil Wayne on Pandora. As soon as I walked into the kitchen, I could barely hear what my girlfriend was saying, so I asked Robin if she would lower the music. I grabbed my Coke, a whole bag of chips, and was making my way back upstairs when I heard Robin call to me, Kuya, what's that? As a side note, Kuya in Tagalog means elder brother. She squeaked as I rounded the steps. What do you mean? I heard something from outside. I groaned. I told my girlfriend to hold on a moment as I went back down into the kitchen to see Robin peeking out through the blinds. Ew, that, that dog, dog is, is back, back, she said, closing up the laptop and heading towards the stairs. I'll be in my room. That thing really gives me the creeps. Sure enough, it was there, sitting at the edge of our property, trying to sound tough. I told my girlfriend I was going to go outside to scare off the dog and that I would call her off. In reality, I wanted to see the thing up close and actually bring it some food if it wasn't aggressive. However, if it was dangerous, I didn't want her to hear me scream like a baby. So I opened the sliding glass door that led towards my backyard and proceeded to walk over to where Robin saw the dog sitting. Now, to get an understanding of our backyard, it had a cement patio that connected to the grass, and at the very end of the yard was a canal. We had cement bases for a fence, but due to the hurricane, all work stopped there. As I approached closer, its silhouette started to make me feel uncomfortable. It did that thing with its eyes that nocturnal animals do when they reflect light, you know, making it look even more creepy. I took a deep breath and was about to let out a Hey boy, you hungry? But before those words could leave my mouth, it quickly jolted up and turned its head back towards the canal. For some reason, this caused me to freeze. I mean, the way it moved was... Off. It let out this moan, or maybe it was a growl. It sounded like the combination between a dog howling and a screaming goat, but more in sync, if that makes sense. I saw its eyes flash that eerie glow again as it spun its body around and darted down towards the canal. It was creepy, sure, but once more I wrote it off as whatever. Another week or so, one of Ashley's dogs was found dead in her backyard. Now, I didn't see it myself, but from the way she described it, the poor thing was torn to shreds, with pieces of its fur scattered all over. The general consensus was that a bobcat or some other wildcat but she wasn't convinced. Jackis was a mastiff. She kept repeating, there was no way some bobcat got to him like that. Now I know what you're thinking. It's most likely related to this thing, right? It was outside of her house that one night too. I mean, the thought crossed my mind, but I didn't want to bring it up around her. And later that same day, I was sitting on my roof. I would crawl out of my window from the second story and recline on the rooftop that hung over the garage, giving me a good view of my neighborhood and telling my girlfriend about all that has happened so far. How I kept hearing strange sounds at night and about how Jackis was found dead. I was in the middle of telling her how these sounds have been increasing in occurrence these past few days. When I heard it again, it sounded louder and much closer. Before I could ask my girlfriend if she heard it as well, she asked, what the hell was that? Confirming that she also heard it. I then proceeded to tell her my theory on how it was connected to the creepy dog. When the weekend came and my girlfriend was in town to visit, I took her and my sister out to dinner. It was a nice meal, steak, potatoes, soda. The latter isn't important because none of us had any alcohol during this meal. On the drive home, we were discussing religion and fate when Robin screamed, What the fuck? Pointing to the roof of a nearby neighbor's house. In my shock, I slammed on the brakes to get a better look. That's when we saw it. Like, really saw it. It was slender and its limbs were outstretched. The joints were bent in some unnatural posture. It had pale gray fur. No, it wasn't fur. It was skin. Its skin was pale gray, and it was stretching extremely tight over its body. 
It was extremely unnerving to look at it. I sat there, foot on the brake, as I tried to make sense of what it was. That's when my sister screamed, I want to go home, and the creature froze. Wait, I thought, did it hear us? There's no way it could hear us. The creature twitched, turning back to face us, once again hitting me with the eerie glow of its eyes, and then it skittered, like the way a lizard does body close to the surface over the other side of the roof towards their backyard i quickly called my neighbor as soon as we got home and told him that we saw something on his roof attempting to not sound crazy i said it looked like he had a huge possum crawling around the second story his reply the wife and i have been seeing this monkey looking thing hanging in the trees at night we called animal control and they said it was most likely a possum who had escaped from a preserve but I know what a possum looks like, and that thing ain't no possum. I was more than a little confused, I guess. I mean, it looked like a long, skinny dog or something. We just saw it crack. Don't you worry though, it just sits there staring at nothing. I figure if it means any harm, it would have done so already. I guess, I said. Well, I just wanted to let you know, it's kind of weird looking. Well, if it comes in here, I'll knock it dead and mount it to my wall. He laughed. And that was the end of it. Jumping ahead here a few weeks ago, early 2020, my wife, the girlfriend from the story, and I ended up moving to Florida, became parents, and were living the good life when my sister and parents came to visit us for the weekend. When the grandparents were enjoying putting our daughter to sleep, Robin suggested looking for creepy videos on YouTube. We're horror fanatics, so why not, right? We came across a few scary story channels, and when we came across another YouTuber, he had a number list of the creepiest things ever caught on camera. We went through various ghost sightings, unexplained occurrences, and even dabbled into the unexplained creature territory. The YouTuber started to talk about the rake, some creepy pasta creature, as with the other items on the list. It had some photos and videos attached, all of which looked like whatever that is, until it came across this one photo, a photo of a long creature sitting on all fours. Robin then quickly said, that looks, looks like, like that, that thing we saw on the roof. Remember, remember that, that Kuya? I looked up and squinted. Yeah, kind of. I'm surprised you remember that. No, she's right, my wife added. I remember it as well and it did look very similar to that. We laughed it off as a strange experience and proceeded to watch the video which more or less said, the rake lives within the deep woods. Reports have also cited the creature in places like Louisiana. We all froze. The hair on the back of my neck stood up as it all came crashing back. I looked up to see my wife and Robin in similar instances of all. Holy crap. I said, now that is creepy. The video proceeded to show more convincing footage of the rake with glowing eyes through a video from a sewer tunnel. I know you know the video I'm talking about. As I watched it though, I started to feel uneasy. Those eyes, they pierced through me. I mean, that's exactly what I remember staring back at me from way before. Then the creature in the video then ducked out of view moving in the same fluid, yet jittery motion as it did on the roof. My wife and sister froze, both visually shaken. This sparked a big discussion on cryptids and the like, ending with both my wife and sister telling me to share our story. Someone has to know something, they said. Something I forgot to mention earlier was the smell. There was always this dry, musty, rotting smell lingering in the air whenever we remember seeing it. But I couldn't find anything that talked about how the rake smells. Guys, did we really encounter the rake back home? Is it possible that there's more than one out there? I mean, what else could it be? I know it's hard to explain, but the creature in that video, its movement was so similar. And those eyes, one doesn't forget a sight like that. Not at all, especially once you've seen it on your neighbor's roof.
My parents divorced when I was eight years old. They had just bought a house together in the woods in Walker, Louisiana. After seeing his relationships, I realized that this is something my father does when his marriage is rocky. He sells his house and then buys or builds a new one for the sake of distraction. I actually seen it work for him. Once engaged in a new project and excited by the possibilities, his wife might forget to ask why he was out so late, who he was with, and why he smells like another woman's perfume. Except that this time, his trick didn't work. My mother finally had enough. I don't even think we lived in the house in the woods for a full year before my mother suggested he go stay with his whore instead. I wasn't terribly upset by this. My father and I had never been close. He was a no-nonsense high school coach, and I was skinny and weird, far from the son that he actually wanted. To be fair though, he didn't try to push me into sports or pressure me to follow football. Instead, he ignored me entirely in favor of my little brother, Trent, who seemed like he was born with a ball in his hand. Trent didn't play one sport. He played every single one of them, starting when he was merely a baby. I never resented either of them for this. I merely mentioned it to help paint a picture of my brother. If Trent and I had been one person, we would actually be a very well-rounded individual. You would have me being dreamy and even-tempered. Trent, sporty and rough and emotional living up very well to the reputation that came with his bright red hair, even when he was still in diapers. You couldn't have two more opposite children, but we loved each other, especially in the early years of our parents' divorce. Even though there were three bedrooms in this house in the woods, Trent and I shared one, not wanting to be separated. That changed around the time I turned 10. I was starting to get a light dusting of very fine pubic hair as well as the weird, self-exploring sessions that came with it. So I figured it was time to get my own room. Without so much asking my mom, I began moving my things to the room across the hall to claim my new space. We had been living in that house in the woods for a couple of years now, and even though it had felt large and empty in the days following my father's leave, now it felt like home. And I had claimed a new room all for myself where I wouldn't be bothered by Trent's nightlight or those soft, irritating, snuffy noises he made in his sleep. But still, even though I figured I was too old for a nightlight, the inky darkness of my room when I turned my bedside lamp off was just a bit too much. My mother would sleep in her room at the end of the hall with the door open so she could hear us if we called, and she would often fall asleep watching TV. The ghostly blue glow of the TV in her room illuminated mine, just enough to pacify me. So I began sleeping with my bedroom door open. I was 10 then, but I'm 30 now. I have not been able to sleep with my bedroom door open for about 20 years because of what I saw standing in my room that night. I don't know what woke me up. I was simply awake and I hadn't been a moment before. Everything was quiet and everything was still. The sleep timer on my mother's TV must have clicked it off because there was no noise anywhere, not even the sound of the air conditioner, not even crickets in the woods outside. Simple, unbroken, silence. I lay in bed for a while, staring at my ceiling and puzzling over why I was even awake. I realized I was very cold, even though the AC wasn't running. With a small shiver, I pulled my cover around my shoulders and rolled over to my side to face my bedroom door. And there it was. As I'm typing this, a strong chill is passing through me. Even 20 years later, the thought of that thing is enough to make every hair on my body stand straight up. I actually got to pee quite badly too but I don't feel like I can move until I finish writing this and I'm done with it until I push that thing out of my head. Actually, to be honest, a small part of me is afraid that I'm writing about it tonight and that you are listening to this because what if I have somehow summoned it and it's gonna be waiting for me in the hallway when I go to the bathroom. But anyways, I'm not sure what I saw, but it was tall. 
to a ten-year-old anyways, and it was very thin. It seemed to shine in the thick darkness of my room. It was so pale. Its skin seemed white and thinner than paper. Its head was round, hairless, a hairless dome. It was naked, I think, and even though I could see no privates, I could make out the sharp ridges and curves of its hips, its fingers, which hung limply at the end of flat, large hands like giant white spiders. It seemed unusually long and alien to me. Whether or not it had a mouth or even a nose, I could not say. The darkness was too deep and the thing too white to even make such distinctions. The worst part about it, though, was its eyes. I could see those, or maybe it had no eyes. Maybe those round black holes in its face were empty sockets, or maybe its brow was so heavy it was hiding them in its shadow. Whether they were there or not, I knew those eyes were looking at me. I froze. A scream rose up in me, but I didn't move. I couldn't move. The thing saw me. I knew, but maybe it didn't realize that I was looking at it. Maybe if I just kept pretending to be asleep, it would leave me alone. I dared not to close my eyes, but I couldn't let the thing out of my sight for a moment. What if it was attempting to come closer? We stared at each other for what felt like forever, but in reality, it was no more than a minute or two. Neither of us moving, neither of us making a sound, both of us just staring. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it was gone. It didn't acknowledge me. It didn't even attack me. It didn't even make a sound, except for the odd popping of its joints and the creaking of the floorboards under its feet. As it strolled down the hall to the kitchen, it was gone. But still, I couldn't move. The thing was still out there somewhere, and it was even more terrible out of sight than from when it was standing in front of me. At least when I could see it, I knew where it was and what it was up to. Now, my mind was full with horrific possibilities of what this thing might be capable of, of what kind of terrible appetites it must possess. I lay there in the dark for over an hour, fretting over this strange creature and listening to the dark, looking for any sign that it was still around, but nothing came. I took a deep breath and got ready to do the bravest thing I had done in all my 10 years. I got ready to run to my mother. I slowly slipped out of bed, expecting the moment my feet hit the floor for the thing to snatch them, but it didn't. I stepped carefully and quietly to my bedroom door, expecting that the moment I peeked my head out, it would be there, but it wasn't. I looked to my left, and then I looked right. I looked to my left again, and then, in a burst of speed that I didn't even know I was capable of, I bolted down to my mother's room. My sudden and explosive entry was enough to make her stir. Drew, she said while clicking on her bedside lamp. Is that you? What's wrong? Mom, Mom, there's something in the house. I saw something looking at me. It was standing in my bedroom doorway and it was looking at me and I think it kind of looked like the kid from Powder like a bald albino or something. I was so relieved to be with her and telling her what I had saw that I didn't notice the look of shock over her face until she grabbed me and pulled me close to her. She was wide awake now and she looked terrified. What did you say? You said someone was standing in your doorway looking at you? I nodded. She turned and looked over her shoulder and that's when I realized for the first time that she wasn't alone. My brother, Trent was asleep in the bed beside her. My mother leaped out of bed and went over to her closet where she kept her handgun. My mother hated that thing, but she insisted on having one. A single mother with only a 10 and a 6 year old needed to protect herself. Mom, what's wrong? I was starting to get scared again. She snatched the cordless phone off its cradle and called my grandfather, who lived about two miles away. Dad, she whispered into the receiver. I need you to stay on the phone with me. If something happens, call the police. About an hour ago, 
Trent came in and got in bed with me. He said he couldn't sleep because somebody was standing in his bedroom doorway watching him. And now, Drew just came in and told me the same thing. I think somebody's in the house. I had never heard my mother so scared. Maybe it's Tommy, or maybe it's somebody else. If it's Tommy, I'm getting a restraining order. Apparently divorce wasn't enough. Mom, it's not that. I said, it can't be. It was too thin. Dad's got a big belly. Sweetie, shh. Okay, Dad, I'm walking through the house right now. Yes, I have my gun. Drew, follow me. If anything happens, run back here and lock the door and do not open it. Until Grandpa or the police get here. I nodded. My mother began to move down the hall, turning on light after light as she did so. Checking every room, every closet. And within a couple of minutes, the whole house had been searched. Only one room left. The kitchen. My mother entered the room and flipped on the light. Seeming to fully expect my father, or some crazy killer, to be standing there. But no, the kitchen was empty too. And we were alone. We were safe. With a sigh of relief, my mother said goodbye to my grandfather and put the phone down on the kitchen counter. There's nobody here, Drew. You must have had a bad dream, that's all. No, Mom. I know what I'm dreaming. This wasn't a dream and Trent saw it too. Did you both watch that powder movie recently or some- Mom! I shouted. She jumped and startled. What? What is it? I pointed. The kitchen door, which led out to the backyard and to the thick, old woods beyond it, stood slightly open. I'm still not sure what I saw that night. I have thought about it and discussed it with my brother and my mother. In recent years, I even questioned my father about it. He wasn't doing too well for a couple of years following the divorce. He was doing some weird and creepy things. But no, he wasn't there that night. And to be honest, I never even thought he had. But I still had to ask, because the other options are too frightening to consider. I don't suppose I'll ever know what that thing was. Maybe that's for the best. What I do know is, I haven't slept with my bedroom door open since that night. Even if for some reason I forget to shut it all the way before I climb in bed, I won't be able to sleep until I go and close it. Because now, in every dark doorway, I see that white face. And I also see those terrible, dark eyes staring at me. Jacob cursed as he pushed through the thick underbrush, trying to make his way to the tree stand he had built earlier in the summer. He was for sure that this location would give him a good sight to the neighboring field, in which he frequently saw large herds of deer. This was going to be his year, and he was sure of it. This is the year that I bring home my trophy buck, he told himself, as he recalled the events of the day so far. He had awakened at 4.30 a.m. He began to get ready for the long day in the woods, on the backside of his farm. His first order of business had been to locate and rescue his gloves and camouflage hunting gear from whatever undisclosed area of his home that his wife had hidden them. He was going to need them this morning to protect him from the bitter cold November morning. How could it be this cold? This early in the year, he wondered as he started to work on his second task of the day, which was to make a breakfast that would stick to his ribs long into the day. But he finally settled on toast, country ham, and scrambled eggs. He topped it all off with a large cup of coffee that had left a bitter aftertaste in his mouth. In fact, he could still taste it. After this, he packed himself a cheese sandwich for lunch. He grabbed his Remington hunting rifle, some coffee, and headed out the door. He loaded his gear into his truck and pulled out of the driveway and turned right into the one-lane blacktop road that led to the backside of his property. After about two and a quarter miles, he turned right again. 
He had to travel about half a mile down that pitiful rut filled excuse for a road when he came to his desired location. He then got out of his truck and loaded his gun and walked off into the woods. Ten minutes out of the truck and he was already cold and it was made worse by the cloudy overcast day and the wind that was blowing through the trees making all the leaves rattle like dry bones. Oh well, he thought, it's going to be a good day anyway, especially if I bring home a big one. Jacob took about ten more steps when an uneasy feeling began to creep over him. He felt as though someone had stepped over his grave. He got the distinct feeling that he was being watched, but by whom? This was, after all, his property, and it was posted. No one had permission to be on his land. He had to be alone, but if he was alone, why couldn't he shake this eerie feeling that was scratching at the base of his skull? Something was off today. There was a silence in the forest. No birds, no insects, only the sound of the wind in the trees. Convincing himself that it was nothing more than a case of nerves, he continued to press on until he came to a clearing, not too far from his tree stand. Stepping into the clearing, Jacob saw the remains of what appeared to be a large deer, but he wasn't quite able to make out what he was seeing from this distance because the sun wasn't completely up yet and the forest was still covered in shadows. Jacob then walked closer to get a better look and found that he had been correct. It was a deer. A large eight-point buck, in fact. Looking at the remains, he felt a sense of dread come over him, and icy fingers dance along his spine. Something about this kill just didn't seem right. The throat was completely torn out, and the stomach was ripped open. Plus, also, several of the internal organs were missing. This definitely wasn't a coyote kill, and no hunter would have done this. They would have taken the head to have it mounted. What could have done this, he wondered. A fear like nothing he had ever experienced before began to wash over him in waves. What is going on, he thought. At nearly 225 pounds, and well over 6 foot, he wasn't one to give in to fear, but now he couldn't seem to calm down, and his heart was beating like a trip hammer. That feeling that he was being watched was getting stronger by the minute, and he couldn't shake the feeling that he was moments away from a bad situation. He slowly started to back away from the mangled body and head back to his truck and back to safety. No more than six steps into his journey. His blood turned to ice in his veins as a deep, guttural scream shattered the eerie silence and what was left of his courage. He had grown up on the farm all of his life and had been an experienced hunter since he was a child. He was familiar with every animal in the part of the state. Fear now gave way to stark terror as he chambered around into his Remington rifle and turned around only to find there was nothing behind him. His mind raced with confusion, and he was confronted with a million thoughts at once. What should I do? What could it be? Should I run? Am I gonna die? His survival sense kicking into overdrive. Jacob decided to continue on his previously contrived plan, which was to get to the truck and get out of there. Slowly and cautiously, he made his way toward the perceived salvation of his vehicle, silently praying every step of the way. With 300 yards separating him from his only avenue of escape, Jacob began to hear heavy footfalls off to his left. He could hear the crunching of withered leaves, sticks, and the breeze that littered the forest floor. Summoning every ounce of courage that remained within him, he forced himself to look in the direction of the noise. And that is when he saw the dark silhouette that followed him through the forest. 
Quickening his pace, he redoubled his efforts to reach the truck and get to a phone and call the sheriff, the game warden, or anyone that would listen. He couldn't tell what it was that was stalking him, but he could clearly see that it towered more than seven feet and was incredibly massive. Jacob couldn't help but think that he was about to become a national statistic, a person who left home under normal circumstances and just disappear without a trace. How many people, he wondered, go into the woods and just vanish, and the authorities just assume that they have become lost, injured, or been the victims of animal attacks, with their bodies never recovered. Please God, don't let that happen to me, he told himself, as he drew closer and closer to his truck. 75 yards became 50, and 50 became 30 and 30 became 10, and like a miracle, he was back and opening his door. Throwing his rifle inside, he pulled himself up into the cab and started the engine and hit the gas. But the truck went nowhere. He had parked in a puddle of mud, and now the tires simply spun in place. Not now, he thought. I can't be stuck, allowing himself a moment to think. Jacob remember. This truck is a four-wheel drive. There is no way I can be stuck. And was ready to punch the gas and leave this nightmare behind. Unfortunately for Jacob, some nightmares are not so easily left behind. And there is nothing worse than a nightmare you can't wake up from. And Jacob was about to learn that the hard way. Hearing something to his right, he turned and immediately wished that he had not. It took him maybe half a second to turn his head, but he would have given anything in the world to have that half second back because it was the last moment that his world would ever see normal again. In that split second, his world changed. It was no longer a place where the world was light and safe, where he was just a husband and a dad and a guy that liked to go hunting and watch football on the weekends. That reality had evaporated away and all that was left was a world where monsters existed and things really do go bump in the night. And now an ambassador from that nightmare realm was standing just outside his passenger door. A visible reminder that his world had been turned upside down. Jacob screamed as he stared transfixed on this escapee from a horror movie. In his most terrifying, fevered dream, he couldn't have imagined that such a thing could exist. It was hideously ugly, easily standing eight feet tall, with a thick, muscular body. There was just something about that face that was just wrong. Almost like a mixture of a man and an animal experiment that had gone horribly wrong. It was the most terrifying thing he had ever seen. It was completely covered with thick, shaggy black hair that was matted in areas with God only knows what, and it walked on two legs, not on four legs, like you would expect from some kind of animal. What was this thing that had shattered his perception of reality? Was it a demon? Was it a werewolf? It can't be, he thought. Those things don't exist. But whatever it was, it was staring at him and it didn't look happy. The menacing juggernaut threw its enormous head back and let out a blood crawling scream that resonated throughout the surrounding area and seemed to vibrate him to his very core. Shocked back into action, Jacob threw his truck into gear and took off as though he was being chased by the very hounds of hell. Jacob, with his mind racing, wondered what he was gonna do. How will I ever feel safe on this farm again, he thought. Are my wife and children in danger? What and where did this thing come from? And will anyone believe me? The whirlwind of thoughts that swirled through Jacob's mind came to an immediate stop as he slammed on his brakes and nearly slid off the road. In a state of disbelief, Jacob sat staring at the large hackberry tree that laid across the dirt road and blocked his path preventing him from reaching the black top and guarantee safety. 
How is this even possible? He thought. I just came down this road not even 30 minutes ago. And this path was clear. It was painfully obvious to Jacob that he had to get that tree move if he was going to make it back home. Since he didn't have a chain to pull the tree out of the road, nor did he have a saw with which he could cut up the unexpected barricade. He was left with a few options, one of which was walking, which he discounted immediately. The most logical course of action that he could come up with was to call for help. His best friend Kenny Patterson owned the farm just over from his. If he were home, he could bring a saw and cut the tree up for him. Jacob, with his nerves still frazzled and frayed, reached into his glove box and pulled out his cell phone and dialed Kenny's number. The phone rang six times and Jacob was about to give up when Kenny answered the phone and said, Hey ugly, what do you want this early in the morning? As quickly as he could, he told the recent events to Kenny and said, Please, hurry. I'm not kidding. There is something out here. Kenny, hearing the shakiness in his friend's voice, assured him that he would be there in a matter of minutes. Jacob thanked him and hanged up the phone, and braced himself for what he was sure would be the longest few minutes of his life. Sitting motionless inside of his truck, every sound made his imagination run wild with fear. Even though little more than three minutes had passed since he had spoken to Kenny, it felt as if hours had passed. The clock seemed to be an eternity. Jacob frequently checked in all directions for any sign to see if this nightmarish monstrosity had pursued them. In every shadow that the forest and on this cloudy day produced, he thought he saw the shape of the black beast that had followed him out of the woods and he was afraid that he would lose himself long before Kenny arrived to clear the tree out of his path. After what seemed like a lifetime, Jacob heard the sound of Kenny's old truck sputtering up the road, and in just moments, he was able to see the old red Chevy as it made its way closer to him. Jacob's spirits lifted when he saw his old friend, and a sense of relief washed over him as he realized that he was no longer alone. Stepping out of his truck, Jacob said, Man, what took you so long? I told you to hurry. Kenny, with a surprised look on his face, what are you talking about? You only called me 11 minutes ago. I think I made pretty good time. Jacob could hardly believe that only 11 minutes had passed. It had seemed so much longer. After apologizing to his friend and telling him exactly how happy he was to see him, both men walked over to the fallen tree and made a discovery that startled them both. The tree had not broken, it had not been cut, it had been pushed over and completely uprooted. All around the tree were large bipedal footprints that had a somewhat human appearance to them, but if they were human, the owner would require a size 28 shoe. Jacob and Kenny looked at each other and then without a word went to work on the tree. Kenny took a chainsaw from the bed of his truck and began to cut up the fallen blockade. Meanwhile, Jacob pulled the logs and debris from the road. Mission accomplished. Kenny put away his saw, and he and Jacob were about to get in their vehicles and leave. But before they could even open their doors, an ear-splitting scream erupted from the woods behind them. Jacob walked over to Kenny and whispered, That's what I was telling you about. I don't know what that thing is, man, but it looks like some kind of monster. And I think we need to get out of here, now. Kenny looked as though the blood had drained completely out of his face, became very pale, as he said to Jacob. Jacob, man, I never mentioned this to anyone before now, but over the last few months, that thing has been killing off a few of my cows. Their throats are usually torn out, and the bodies are mangled and broken. I didn't want anyone to accuse me of being crazy and making stuff up, so I never said anything about it. But that's the reason I rushed over here when you called. 
I actually heard that sound a few times off in the distance at night, but never this close. So I think you are right, old buddy. It's time to go. Cautiously and with a sense of urgency, Jacob and Kenny climbed into their vehicles and made their way back into the blacktop. Both vehicles then began the two and a half mile trek that led back to Jacob's house so they could decide what course of action should be taken. Jacob could feel the temperature drop as snow began to gently fall. He then reached over and turned his wipers on as snow began to pelt the windshield harder. As he passed his neighbor, William Springer's farm, he noticed a herd of deer grazing in the field that bordered his own property. Having put a distance between himself and the nightmare he had just encountered, Jacob felt a renewed sense of security as his fatigued nerves began to calm down. Not willing to let this opportunity pass him by, Jacob turned on his hazard lights and pulled to the shoulder of the road and signaled Kenny to do the same. Kenny knew what Jacob was thinking as he pulled in behind him and turned his ignition off. Getting out of his truck, Kenny said, What are you doing, man? We need to get out of here now. Jacob said, I know, and we will, in just a minute, man. I just can't turn this down. I have to take the shot. That's a six-point buck standing there. It's not the trophy that I wanted, but at least I won't end up going home empty-handed. And after what happened this morning, I think I deserve a little something good. All right, just take the shot so we can go. I still don't feel right about this, Kenny said. Jacob steadied his rifle across the hood of his truck. He zeroed in on the buck and was getting ready to fire. That's when he heard Kenny make a gasping noise and whisper. Oh my God, what is it, man? What's wrong with you? Raise your scope three inches, he said. Raising the scope, Jacob immediately saw what had been the cause of Kenny's alarm. Standing just outside a tree line in the edge of the field was the creature that they had left behind. Not even five minutes. Was this thing following them? Was it after the deer? What was it doing? Jacob watched the creature through his scope for a full 30 seconds before it even moved. And when it did, it ignored him and the deer and started to walk towards William's barn that was just about 500 yards from where the woodland demon had been standing. Jacob called out to Kenny and said, Kenny, call William and tell him that there is something trying to get into his barn. I know he has livestock in there, and if that thing gets in it, it will kill all of them. Attempting to get rid of this monster, werewolf, wendigo, or whatever it was, Jacob fired a shot but missed. The creature turned towards them and glared at them through red, hate-filled eyes and then began to run towards them at full steam. Kenny, who was still on the phone with William, screamed at Jacob to get in his truck and go. Jacob did as he was told and Kenny followed right behind them. Starting their trucks, Jacob and Kenny both raced to Jacob's house as though they were driving on the NASCAR circuit. Arriving at home, Jacob gun in hand, ran inside to get a phone book so that they could call the game warden and the police and get some kind of animal control out there to get rid of this thing. Jacob had just stepped out of his front porch when they heard gunfire coming from over at William's place. Dropping the phone book and running back inside, Jacob grabbed his 12 gauge shotgun and some shells and handed them to Kenny who took little time in loading it. Jacob and Kenny now locked and loaded walked together to their truck and got ready to mount up a rescue for their neighbor William. Simultaneously, both of them stopped in their tracks as a familiar but uneasy feeling crept over them and Jacob's two German shepherds began to whimper and ran under the front porch to hide. Kenny, whose throat had gone dry as a bone, whispered to Jacob and said, I have a really bad feeling about this. No sooner had the words escaped his lips, they heard a scream erupt from the forest, off to the right, and the creature exploded from the trees in front of them. Until now, neither man had been able to fully appreciate the colossal size and scope of the beast, but standing less than 30 feet away from them, they were almost overcome by the sheer magnitude of it. 
Jacob had seen it up close earlier from his truck while sitting down and had guessed the height at maybe 8 feet. But now, standing there, looking up, he could tell that this fellow was 8.5 or 9 feet tall and would tip the scale at 800 to 1,000 pounds. It had inhuman long arms that were easily seen beneath its long shabby black hair which covered it from head to toe. The chest was larger than a 55 gallon drum and there was little doubt that it could have pulled the arms off and ate and now it stood there staring at them. Jacob and Kenny both opened fire without hesitation. The creature screamed with rage as the bullets tore into its massive body knocking it to the ground but not killing or seriously injuring it. Jacob and Kenny watched speechless as it crawled into the tree line, struggled to its feet, and limped away. Jacob ran back to the porch and grabbed the phone book and called the local game warden. Nearly two hours later, Gene, the local warden, showed up to take their statements and told them that he had been called out to answer numerous such reports in the area, but he wasn't sure what to make of all these reports. Guys, he said, I don't know what to tell you. There is no animal in this area, or any area for that matter that fits your description. I'm not saying I don't believe you, I just don't know what it is. Jacob, whose face was reddened with anger, said, Come here, here is the blood from where we shot it, and here are the footprints. A look of complete confusion washed over Gene's face, and he asked if they would care to go with him as he tried to track it. Jacob and Kenny agreed but they said they weren't going without a gun. Gene stated that he planned to take his gun as well. All three men loaded their guns and set out following the tracks and droplets of blood that had fallen on the leaves. They followed the trail for about a mile until arriving at a creek that was located deep in Jacob's woods where the tracks that they were following were joined by others just like them. Some were smaller, but at least one set was larger. Deciding that the safest course of action would be to return home, they all went back to Jacob's. None of them gave up the idea of staying out in the woods, longer since there was now, apparently, more than one creature. And the cloudy overcast day made the forest seem even darker than it would normally be this time of day. Back at Jacob's, Gene informed them that there was nothing left that he could do but file it under an unknown animal sighting, which made both Kenny and Jacob anything but happy. Jacob and Kenny spent the next couple of days trying to warn their neighbors to use caution when they were out in the forest. Most of their friends just laughed at them and said they had most likely just seen a bear or something. No one believed them except William, who had also seen it himself the same day they had. He had even taken a shot at it, but missed. Jacob, William, and Kenny knew what they had seen, and they knew it was still out there, and they didn't care who believed them and who didn't. Over the next few weeks, more and more neighbors began to take the story a little more seriously, as family pets began to disappear, and other pets were found mangled. Other farms in the area began to find their cows and other livestock torn open, with their throats ripped out. Just a week after shooting the creature in his yard, Jacob's own German Shepherd was found dead with its throat torn out and it was hanging across a limb in a tree in his front yard. It almost seemed like a revenge killing. A few days later, one of William's new animals died the same way. Some people in the area still don't believe. They think the whole story was made up but Jacob and Kenny know that there is still something out there in the forest. They still occasionally find tracks or a slaughtered cow or goat. They still hear the blood curling screams off into the woods at night. They know that there is still something out there, watching and waiting, biding its time. Something cold and cunning and cruel. Something not human with a taste for blood and revenge. This story was told to me by one of my good friends who has Navajo background on her father's side. It happened several years ago 
when she was spending the last two weeks of summer visiting relatives on a reservation in New Mexico and is by far one of the creepiest things I ever heard. My friend Jessie was 12 at the time and playing outside with her cousins. They were tossing a frisbee around and one of the younger kids threw it too hard. It flew over the fence and was swallowed up by a small grove of oak trees. Jessie, being the eldest, went to retrieve it, leaving her 11-year-old cousin Ellie in charge until she got back. The sun was setting, lighting up the sky in brilliant shades of orange as Jessie made her way over to the grove. After some poking around, she found the frisbee caught in one of the tree's branches. As she climbed, she began to sing an old Navajo song, but stopped singing when her body suddenly went cold. That's exactly how Jessie described it to me. Cold, as if she'd been dunked in ice water. You know that annoying scary story cliche of feeling like you're being watched? Well, it's only cliche because it's true. Jessie could feel a pair of eyes following her, even when she looked around her and saw nothing. Seriously creeped out, she grabbed the frisbee and ran back to her grandmother's house, just in time to see the old woman step into the porch and call for the kids to come inside. However, the true horror didn't start until several hours later. Jessie, her cousin Ellie, and Ellie's little sister Clara were asleep in their grandmother's guest room when Jessie woke up to the strangest sound she had ever heard. She described it to me as a cross between radio static and the noise an old movie reel makes. At first, it sounded distant, but after a minute or two, Jessie realized it was getting closer. Beside her, Ellie rode over and said, What is that? I don't know, Jesse whispered. They waited, holding their collective breath. By now, the sound was right outside the window. And that's when Jesse realized it was singing. At this point in her retelling of the story, Jesse went white and began glancing over her shoulder. She told me the song was the exact same one she had been singing in the tree grove earlier. It sounded so wrong, she said, rubbing her arms as if a cold breeze had rushed by her. Remember, when we listened to that clip of the very first recording of a human voice, how weird it sounded? When I nodded, Jessie added, it was like that, but a little clearer. Somehow, that made it even worse. Jesse and Ellie were both terrified, while Clara, unaware, slept on. Through the thin blue curtain over the window, they could see the dark shadow of something peering in at them. To this day, Jesse can't explain what motivated her to get up and see for herself, especially because she was scared shitless. Ignoring Ellie's protest, she slid out of bed and walked across the room on shaky legs. As soon as she drew back the curtain, she regretted her choice. Staring back at her was the most terrifying creature she had ever seen. It had the head of a deer with antlers like dead tree branches and eyes so black they seemed to absorb the faint silver moonlight. It had a scrawny humanoid body with abnormally long arms and legs. And as Jesse stood there, caught in its hideous gaze, it raised a hand and scratched at the window with a horrible screeching sound that made Jessie's skin crawl. It was Ellie's scream that jolted Jessie out of her terrified state. She stumbled back from the window and landed on the carpet floor. Clara woke up and began screaming too. Then their grandmother ran in and turned on the light. The thing at the window had vanished, leaving behind three long scratches in the glass and the whole family terrified. Jessie's grandmother was able to calm down the hysterical children enough so they could tell her what happened. As she listened, her face became pale. 
She hustled the girls downstairs to the living room and made up a bed for them on the couch. She then sat by them all night, and whenever one of them asked her what was going on, the old woman simply shook her head. Needless to say, Jessie and her cousin didn't sleep for the rest of the night. The next morning, Jessie's grandmother announced that everyone was to stay inside that day. No arguments. She looked so shaken that nobody dared to protest. Around noon, she called for a medicine woman to come and bless the house. Later, after the woman left, Jessie merged into the kitchen where her grandmother was loading the dishwasher. Tell me what that thing was, she said bluntly. Her grandmother sighed and motioned for Jessie to sit down. You have heard the legend of skinwalkers. Yes. Jessie frowned and nodded, vaguely recalling the story. So that was a skinwalker? Her grandmother nodded. Yes. Grandma, said Jessie at a light dawn. I think it overheard me singing in the tree grove yesterday. Her grandmother's dark eyes narrowed. Why do you say that? Because it was singing that same song, you know. The song that you used to sing to me when I was little. Her grandmother was silent for a long time before whispering. You're a very lucky person. But luck has its limits. From now on, you must be more careful. The look in the old woman's eyes as she spoke those words still haunts Jessie to this day. As I said earlier, that was years ago. Seven, to be specific. Jessie has returned to the res many times actually, each without incident. But she has never set foot in that tree grove again, and most likely, never will. Jessie's grandmother died this past March, at the age of 87. And Jessie later moved in with her auntie for the summer, so she could help clean up the old house, which the family was going to rent out. She had been there for about a week when I went down there to visit her. On my first night, we sat on the porch and drank some beers, and I found my eyes drifting towards the tree grove. So that's where it all happened? Jessie shuddered and nodded. Yeah, tomorrow... I'm taking you to the medicine woman and have her bless you. Is that actually necessary? The look Jessie gave me nearly turned me to stone. You think nothing will happen to you because you're white. But when you're in Navajo land, you're in Skinwalker land. Take caution. I nodded. That night, I swore I heard radio static outside the house. When I brought it up to Jessie... The next morning, she didn't speak, but grabbed my arm and practically dragged me to the medicine woman, where I was blessed. Nothing happened for the rest of the trip, and I went back to the city. I didn't post this here with the intention of teaching a moral, but I suppose if there is something to be learned from the story of the singing skinwalker, it's that there are things out there we can't explain. The look in Jessie's eyes when she recounted her experience and told me everything I need to know, what she saw, truly, horrified her. And all I can say is, I'm grateful I didn't have to go through it myself. After what happened to me all those years ago, the one place in the whole world that still rattles my body and sends chills up my spine, happens to be my grandmother's farm. When my parents and I would go visit my grandma's one-story farm every three years, I was put in the same room. The room and all its velvet blankets and puffy pillows had a cozy vibe to it, along with the rest of the house. But at nighttime, the large window in front of the bed painted a picture of the unsettling wilderness outside which wouldn't help with my imagination. And ever since I was six, my brain terrified me with that imagination, using vivid nightmares, sleep paralysis, and everything else in between. So naturally, my fear of the window was always there. You see, most kids have monsters underneath their beds or in their closets. 
But at my grandma's house, there was something that lurked outside that window. The first time I ever saw it was at two in the morning. The creature, which I assumed was just in my head and I was imagining, was at the edge of the wood staring at the window. It was a goat standing on two legs. Its body had the shape of a human and its claws dangling around its thighs. I slammed my eyes shut and covered myself with my soft blanket, waiting for the thing to evaporate from my imagination. As you can guess, I was tired by the time I woke up. That morning, when my parents were at the town's Walmart and I was trying to forget last night's experience, I had a pleasant conversation with Grandma. We loved to talk and we had a special type of chemistry that transcended our generational differences. Curious about her farm, I wanted to know about all her animals. Well, we have all sorts of animals, she said with a grin. I have chickens, peacocks, sheep, hogs, ducks, horses, ponies. I have just about any animal on this farm besides any kind of goat. You said any goat? I said, recalling the form outside my window. Why don't you like any goats? Can't you milk them and make cheese? Grandma's face darkened and she stroked her fingers through her gray hair as her eyes stared into space. Well, according to some people, after God created sheep, the devil, in an effort to desecrate God's sheep, created different kinds of goats. Angry after the devil disgraced his sheep, created a wolf to eat the goats. In a massive tantrum of rage, the devil bit the tails of the goats, marking them as an unholy animal. Then, with a quizzical and hard to decipher face, she said, I thought you would have seen it by now, haven't you? I knew what she was talking about right away, and it seemed I would burst into a fit of scared shrieking and crying at the thought of my grandmother confirming the thing outside my window was actually real. I tried to rationalize the situation, thinking the goat-like creature was just a dream and that what my grandma said was unrelated but at the sight of my distress my grandmother destroyed that idea with the opening of her mouth it won't hurt you if you stay inside at night so there's nothing to worry about it was supposed to be a comforting statement but her actually confirming this made it worse Grandma pretended to forget the conversation, never speaking of it for the rest of the trip. When the night came, I decided to sleep in my parents' bedroom, where the bed faced away from the window, but I swear I heard a glassy tapping from behind me. Lucky for us, my parents and I left the farm the next day, leaving behind the forest and fields of Maryland. But three years after this initial incident, after blocking the creature from my memory, I saw it a second time at 11 o'clock at night. I was half asleep on grandma's couch to the sound of the TV when a reporter shouting, breaking news. My eyes initially darting around the room and my brain adjusting to consciousness. I was in shock as I saw the creature hunched over in front of the living room window the half goat sprang from the window and ran into the distance on its two legs. I slapped myself. Snap out of it. Snap out of it. But nothing could stop the memories of the creature. And what grandma had said about it, I paced around the room with adrenaline flooding my body. Wanting to flee, but not knowing where to go. With a few sleeping pills, however, I willed myself to sleep with the living room curtains drawn. The morning after, I found a note on the kitchen table. My parents were shopping, and Grandma was at a doctor's appointment. I was alone in the house, and me wanting to find out what was going on, I plugged in my grandmother's outdated Macintosh for a bit of research. Half goat, half man, I typed. 
which brought up a Wikipedia page on different kinds of cryptids. Not exactly what I was looking for. Goat creature in Maryland. I corrected. And as soon as I hit search, Google presented me with another Wikipedia page. This one on a creature known as the Goatman of Maryland. This was exactly what I was looking for. The Goatman of Maryland is a legendary half goat, half human creature that has the head and the hind of a goat and the body of a human. The rest of the page went on to explain how the locals suspect the Goatman is either a failed gene mixing science experiment or a demonic spawn of the devil, as grandma had said. For the rest of the week, I saw it every single night. Whenever I was trying to fall asleep in my room, it would be staggering around the clearing outside my window. If I was watching TV late at night, the goat man would be gazing at the screen from the living room window. And on the last day, when I was feeding grandma's peacocks in the evening, she came to bring me inside after she saw it approaching the farm. By the end of the second visit, seeing the goat man was something normal. And with the occasional reminder from grandma, I respected it and its personal space. Three years later, however, my third visit to grandma's ranch Show me what happened when you didn't honor the goat man's boundaries. On the local news, there was one headline stirring up the rustic community. Ten professional boar hunters killed in animal attack. My parents thought it was horrible, but grandma and I shot each other looks of shared knowledge. The next morning, the paper arrived at the farm, where the hunting tragedy made the front page. The night before, police found 10 hunters mutilated to death by a wild animal. The hunters' AR-15 magazines were completely full upon dying, and local authorities are stumped as to how none of them could have gotten a single shot off. My parents, who had no knowledge of the goat man, had no idea what caused the attack and were as ignorant as the rest of the investigators. So I had to ask grandma why my parents hadn't seen it yet. Well, she said, the creature only appears to those he finds interesting. You have to understand it can change its views on people. I have these scars from when I was a little girl, but after it got used to me, it stopped. My parents, who were your great grandparents, were demoted to the low end of the thing's opinions. Their passing and my survival go to show how unpredictable it can be. I was shaking, even more freaked out by that. The thing had attacked grandma when she was young and it seemed like the goat man could change its opinion of me in the blink of an eye. It almost seemed like I had developed something with the creature during my last visit by seeing it all the time and watching TV with it. And not once did I ever go outside at night when it was in charge of the farm. I respected it. Could it really forget all that? Or was I reading into grandma's statements more than I should have? In the visits following that year, I read some news articles about mutilated hikers, missing campers, and farm animals turning up dead. The goat man was getting more aggressive. One time, the creature looked right into my soul with its black empty eyes. And for the first time since my initial viewing of it, my body gave to the most feared dread I had ever felt. The more violent the news stories became, the more I felt that the goat was getting more aggressive. Grandma even ended up buying more curtains for the house, acquire a better lock for the door, and actually went to a shooting range to learn how to use a shotgun. It came to the point where I was trying to make peace with the creature by leaving pig food in the field for it to eat, but instead it snatched one of the hogs from the pig pen and ran into the woods. 
On the last day of the visit, I woke up to the sound of ear splitting banging on the front door. Grandma was gripping her new shotgun, and with my dad holding a baseball bat, they waited for the intruder to burst through the door. Yet the banging subsided after a few minutes, the chirping and croaking of insects and frogs replacing it within the hour. After that incident, we didn't visit the ranch for five years, and I was nearing the end of my high school by then. My parents actually encouraged Grandma to move out of the house. In light of people in her town being discovered murder in their own homes, but being the stubborn grandma she was, she decided to go against it. Besides, she thought she knew how fortified her farm was. A few weeks ago, we returned to that awful farm, finding barbed wire on the outskirts of the field. There were fewer animals now, and I swear some of the surviving pigs have faded scars on their bodies from scratches stabs and bites not even the most vicious bear could manage. I was more jittery than I ever been in my life and it was all because I knew that goat man was scheming someone in the deep woods sensing that I had arrived on its land. I spoke with grandma who showed me a newspaper talking about how the FBI was getting involved in the murder investigations here and that the criminal would be behind bar soon. However, as grandma told me, other farmers around town were speaking about how the FBI's true motive was to cover up the real culprit. When we were having dinner, I poked at my food, ignoring the discourse my family was having. Afterwards, I went to my room and made sure the door was shut before I hopped into bed and waited. After hours of anticipating, in the field, beyond my window, the monster dragged the bloody body of a peaceful doe into view. The goat man ripped the deer's intestines out and bit into the insides with its evil loving fangs spilling blood onto the moonlit ground. It turned its head to face my direction, hurling a piece of deer at the window. I jerked as blood splattered against the pane like a sheet of rain startling me to full awareness. Me rushing from my bed to get a closer look at the field, I saw the goat man had left behind the body of a deer. It was mocking me, and I was sure of it. I settled back into bed with the blood sliding down the window, wrapping myself in my blanket as if it was armor, and getting ready for whatever might happen next. I have no idea how, but I drifted asleep with a piece of the creature's latest meal stuck to my window. That was when I had the worst nightmare any human mind could produce. It was a once in a lifetime dream of horror where the creature had crept into my room and was slicing chunks of muscle from my limbs and carving blocks of flesh out out of my torso with its claws, choking me with its horns. The pain was real and I smelled the rotten stench of the creature's dirt matted fur. It was as if my mind was nagging at me and screaming at the top of its lungs for me to wake up. So I did. Soaked in sweat, I sent my eyes flying open, gasping like I was on the edge of dying. As I scrambled to see any sign of the goat man's presence outside, I panicked upon seeing several inconsistencies with how the room was when I went to sleep. Now, the door was wide open and something had smeared deer blood on the inside of the window and that's when the tapping reached my ears. Not from the window, but from my bed frame. Two furry hands slumped over the frame, claws dripping blood onto the sheets. I froze, the form getting to its feet and tilting its head as it examined me, too weak to fight and too shocked to run, I waited to die. But to my surprise, instead of slashing my belly, the goat man spoke. You be not ripe, it said before crouching on all fours and scurrying and walking out of the house. When the police arrived, 
They found the lifeless body of grandma who had died of a heart attack. After that, the FBI showed up, erasing all evidence of forced entry and the strange deer blood being inside the house. With me sobbing and my parents crying, dad decided to get us a hotel and I actually rejoiced at the fact that our room was on the third floor. I shed a few tears and had a good rest. The thought of what the creature had said sipping through my mind. That was two weeks ago and until now I believe I would never have to see that farm for the rest of my life. But as it turns out my grandmother had left the farm to me. Not only that she clearly stated in her will that I should also inherit her shotgun. I don't want to go back there but because she died I feel a weight of guilt dragging me down. My heart desires for me to follow her last wishes and they involve going back to Maryland with her gun. But first I'm going to try to get a priest to bless the farm or an old American native elder to perform a smudging ritual. Even though I'm skeptical about those ideas working, I don't know when I'll have an update. I just know it has to be soon or else. I wanted to share something that I experienced as a child. I'm somewhat a believer of the paranormal, but the analytical rational side of me always begs to differ slightly. This story is also very true. My grandmother isn't one to play around, especially about something like this. I'm not sure if you all will believe me, but I do want to say that this absolutely scared the crap out of me, and still actually does. So I thought I would share. I apologize in advance if I don't format my story correctly, or isn't as eloquent as other stories. I was about 10 or 11 years old at the time of this story. My mom wasn't home. I can't remember exactly where she was, but it was just me and my grandma on this one night. It was around this age that I had discovered whistling, how to do it well, and I found myself doing it quite often. At nighttime though, my grandma didn't like me doing it and kept telling me not to whistle at night and how it wasn't good. Despite her countless warnings, I just couldn't stop. It was a bad habit that I found myself doing without even thinking. So I'm not sure if you guys know already, but apparently whistling at night is really bad. My grandmother said that when you whistle at night, it's basically an invitation for the spirits to come to your house or something like that around that definition. Now, my grandmother is a firm believer of the paranormal. She has experienced a lot of stuff, but being young, I obviously didn't know that. Just as a side note, she has this thing with mirrors at night and avoids them. It's really bad apparently. I'm pretty sure it stems from a deep cultural belief one of which I have almost no knowledge of as I was born in a different country and so I'm not subjected to her cultural beliefs. After the whistling incident and realizing my grandmother doesn't do certain things for no reason I developed a fear of mirrors even though I didn't really know why. I know it's kind of stupid. I might ask her one day. Moving on, being the dickhead that I was at the time, I didn't listen most likely due to the fact that I didn't really believe that such a thing was possible. This night was no different. I was whistling to my heart's desires. Everything was going as normal that night and I slept in the room at the very back of our house. My grandmother was in the room just outside of mine. It was kind of like a sitting room. I'm not sure what Americans call it. The lounge I guess? I was sleeping away until my grandmother shook me to wake up. I'm a very heavy sleeper, but when she began to wake me up, I got up right away, and that never happens. As soon as I woke up, I could see the fear and shock in her eyes. I will never forget the way she looked at me 
She told me I couldn't sleep in that room and instead made me sleep with her in one of the rooms at the front of the house. So the rooms from the front to the back were pretty far away. Initially, I was confused like, why can't I sleep in that room? And why did she look so scared? She didn't tell me that night, but the next day, she asked me if I heard anything that night, and I said no. She then told me that while she was in the other room, she heard someone standing right outside of my window, whistling. I always wondered what would have happened if my grandmother wasn't there, or if she didn't hear it. Even though I wasn't a witness to this, I truly do believe her. And ever since that day, I don't ever whistle at night again. By the way, I did some research on the mirrors. I found out that if you sleep in a room that has a mirror in it, and that you can see it from where you sleep, and an open window, you're basically calling your dead ancestors to come knocking. So let this be a warning. If you're in bed tonight, in your own room, and you can see a mirror from where you're at, I would recommend you get rid of it. That is, if it's not too late. Hi everyone. This story comes from one of my friends who used to be a ranger at the national park I work at, and not from my personal experience. I asked him to tell me his scariest experience at the job, and it just so happened to be his last. I'll tell it from the first person view. My normal shifts were during the day, 9 to 5 like most people. But on that day, we were shorthanded on the night shift because the last person who worked during those hours had just quit. Lately, we had a whole lot of people quitting the night shift, so that meant that I had to cover. Strange enough, I never had to work the graveyard shift before then, and I was actually excited for it. I had brought some coffee and 5 hour energy shots with me because the hours ran 10 to 5, and there was no way I would make it that far naturally. I got to my tower right before 10 o'clock when it was already pitch black and the cold July night had fully set in. The tower was very tall with several flights of stairs leading up to the top. The whole thing was mostly surrounded by thick forest except for the trail I came in from and a murky pond that was just to the right of one of the tower legs. I climbed up and all I could hear was the non-stop sounds of crickets, frogs, and the occasional owl. When I hit the top, I fumbled with my keys until I finally found the right one and walked right on in. The one room was small and square shaped. Three of the walls were mostly glass, and the other one wasn't and had a door I just came in. The roof went up like a pyramid for some short feet until it peaked and it was all made of wood. To my left was a nicely made bed and a nightstand with a lamp and a flashlight on top. It's not like I'm going to be using the bed though. On the wall next to that was my CB radio and communication stand, which every one of these towers had. Next to that sat my fridge and microwave, which was part of a small kitchen that extended to the other wall as well. Inside the kitchen on the right wall were several cabinets. Some small ones that held snacks and some canned foods. And another set of giant cabinets that I couldn't open. Which most likely had vacuums and other cleaning supplies that weren't above my pay grade. I went over to the communication stand. And did my standard check to make sure everything was working. I called into the ranger station's channel. And said, Hey Donnie, it looks like it's just you and me tonight. Donnie didn't say anything back. So I figured he was just taking a shit. I went and grabbed the flashlight on the stand and reached into one of its drawers, pulling out a set of binoculars from it. I went back out to the balcony and checked to make sure no fire hazards or any other kind of dangerous things were over there. Once I checked that box off my to-do list, I headed back inside and pulled out the chair from the communication stand and put it by one of the glass walls and grabbed a granola bar from one of the kitchen cabinets to munch on. 
I raised the binoculars up to my eyes and looked over to the surrounding forest. It didn't seem like any animals were up and about and no birds were in the sky. I skimmed over a couple of clearings to make sure that no teenagers were off camping illegally. Then I went and peeked over at a far ridge where I saw a snowman standing alone in the gap of the trees. Hold the fuck up. It was July. I looked again to see it wasn't a snowman, but some kid in a shitty ghost costume. It looked like the ones from Charlie Brown, with the big black holes for eyes that looked more like they were colored black than actual holes. The kid was still and staring right into where I was at, unmoving. I couldn't see the kid's parents anywhere, and by now it was rolling up to be 11 o'clock, so that meant something was up. I broke contact on the kid and walked to the radio, calling into the station. Hey Donnie, are you done taking a shit yet? I barely made it out, but I'm here now. I chuckle. Donnie was always good for a laugh. There's some kid with a blanket walking around the southeast sector. And they look alone. A blanket? What the hell are you even talking about? It's a ghost costume. It's got the black holes for eyes and stuff. You mean like the Charlie Brown costume? Can you check it out? Yeah, I'll go and see what's up. I'll call in on the walkie-talkie to tell you what I see. Roger that. I turned off the radio and crossed over to the nightstand drawer to grab the walkie-talkie. Once I had it, I sat back down in the chair and put the binoculars up to my eyes, zooming in to where the kid was. The ridge was empty, with no kid in sight which I knew would make this a thousand times harder. I pulled up the antenna on the walkie-talkie and dialed to the right channel. Donnie, Donnie, you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. I'm getting close to the sector. I'm heading up to a ridge for a better view. Perfect, that's where I saw the kid, but they moved on since then. Well, I'm just gonna check around to see if I can find anything. I watched as Donnie came over to the ridge waving his flashlight around the dark until he looked towards the tower and shrugged. Nothing over here. Damn. Hopefully he turns up again. Until then, I'll just notify the police and check with any missing reports. Alright, I'm gonna go back to where Donnie's voice cut out and I saw his flashlight turn off in the distance. The spot where he was at was swallowed in by darkness. Donnie, are you there? I heard no response, and I quickly rushed outside the door and around the corner to where I saw him, yelling his name, only to hear my voice echo in the woods, and that's when it hit me. There wasn't a single other sound in the whole forest. The crickets and frogs had stopped chirping, the wind didn't rustle through the leaves, everything was completely standstill. I could hear my heart beating in my ears, and nothing else. I moved my flashlight around the woods attempting to find them. I got into that state of mind where I got so scared my throat closed up. And if I moved, I felt like something very bad was going to happen. I had to do something. I turned around. And as I did, I glanced at the stairs below me. At the bottom of the stairs stood a skinny, horrible, angled woman. She was tall, dripping with water, with black hair and dark murky blue skin that was stretching across her bent and broken bones. Her gray dress was shredded and her black shoes were muddy and wet. And her face, her eyes were milky white and her mouth hung wide open like a snake, like her jaw had been broken. She let out a blood crawling and ear piercing scream of agony and began to shuffle up the stairs so fucking fast that I snapped out of my fear lock and I ran the fuck back inside slamming and locking the door behind me there was no way she could run that fast even if all of her bones weren't broken in wrong directions I ran back to the kitchen and grabbed the biggest knife I could find and then I pulled out the walkie talkie screaming into it is anyone there? Donnie, where the fuck are you man? someone Answer me. Then I heard the cracking of a door. I slowly turned. 
and I froze when I saw what was there. The door was still there, locked and shut, and had been completely undisturbed. What scared me was the giant cabinet that was supposed to be locked, now stood open, with a kid dressed like a Charlie Brown ghost, standing just in front of it. I stood there, not moving until I heard the little shit giggle. I recognized that giggle. No fucking way. I pulled off the sheet to see one of Donnie's kids, Marvin, sporting a smirk and a walkie talkie. Dad, Dad, I got him. I bet he pissed his pants just like I said he would, right? He and his other son laughed from the other end of the walkie. I was mad, but also glad that I wasn't about to get murdered in a wooden tower. I grabbed his walkie and shot back. Piss me off is what you did, you fucking asshole. I hope you're happy. Hearing you scream like a little girl. Sure did make me happy, alright. Yeah, screw you too. That wasn't even me. That was your stupid zombie chick. Who even was that? Your wife? My what? Does the ghost look like a zombie from that far away? You said yourself it looked like Charlie. Not the ghost, dumbass. The woman on the stairs. She screamed and ran up them so that she could scare me into the tower. Hell, she must be like an Olympic runner. Who was that? Dean. I'm not exactly sure who you're talking about. I didn't put no woman on the stairs. After hearing that he would have the night shift for the next couple of weeks until they found a replacement, my friend quit and vowed to never go back to the park to this day. He swears that either Donnie never told him about that part being a prank or that he saw something unrelated. I began to question my own participation in the night shifts and consider myself lucky that the few times I've been on it, I had been stationed at the north and east sectors. Isengloskagen is a forest in far north Norway. I recently moved to Luxelev for work. Even though it was January, I figured that since I was out in the wilderness, that I might as well go out into the woods to explore a bit. There wasn't a whole lot to do in town. Besides, I heard the trails in this part of the country were pretty nice. There was only a few blocks between my house and the edge of the woods. Anyways, I grabbed a bottle of water and a little bag with trail mix. I was going on a trail after all, and off I went. It had snowed the day before. I guess snow is pretty common up here. It was a pretty soft snow, the kind that ski resorts prefer. It would crunch loud as I stepped on it. Despite the trail being covered up by the snow, I was pretty confident in my ability to keep track of the trail. Since the forest was somewhat dense, and the opening where the trees were removed was distinguishable, and so I wasn't worried about getting lost. It was still pretty early in the afternoon, only about 1 p.m. I wasn't worried about the sun going down. Then again, I had only moved from Virginia fairly recently, so Norway might as well have been a different planet in terms of climate and daylight. At least, that's what I thought. It might have just been a big change that I was seeing as being bigger than it was. After about half an hour, I wasn't terribly deep in the woods. I was moving at a pretty slow pace after all. I had passed a lot of scenery, but nothing that really stood out. Just a lot of trees, a few which had fallen. It was at this point that I realized something that surprised me just a little bit. I wasn't alone in the woods. I stopped briefly when I noticed that a few flakes were weakly drifting to the ground and noticed that I could hear something else. I could hear the sound of snow crunching under a human's foot. They didn't sound like they were wearing heavy boots or anything. It was much more quiet. I could only really tell it was a person because it was clearly two feet. They sounded distant. Just barely close enough for me to actually hear it. 
The woods were pretty quiet. It wasn't windy or anything like that. That's when I saw her in the distance. A woman. Even though my memory is shaky. I say that she was about the ballpark of about 50 yards away. I could just barely see her moving between the trees. Drifting almost casually through the snow. But something struck me about her appearance though. So I knew I had to get closer to her to know if I was right or not. So I pursued her. I didn't want to call out to her yet, but I did begin trying to hurry up. She didn't seem like she was moving very fast, but I was struggling to keep sight of her in the forest. Finally, I was about 10 yards away from her, and now I was close enough to confirm what I thought I had seen before. The woman was completely naked. I figured this woman must need help, that she must have been on something, or she was mentally ill. Nobody walks around in the snowy woods with no clothes on, with nothing on. Excuse me, I piped up, but she didn't acknowledge me. She must have been on some serious drugs. Excuse me, I repeated, a bit more loud this time. She kept walking, even though when I said that, her pace had slowed just a little bit. I didn't mean to stare, considering the situation, but she really was gorgeous from what I saw of her. Without going into any details, I'll just say her body and what little of her face I managed to see was damn near perfect. I shook off the distraction and began trying to approach her. I got to about five yards from her when she suddenly stopped. It was such a sudden thing that I stopped too. Excuse me, ma'am. Are you okay? I asked in the best Norwegian I could, even though I knew it wasn't very good. She stood motionless in the forest for a few seconds before quickly turning to me. I then got a good look at her face. She didn't seem bothered by the cold. Her flowing blonde hair looked to have just come from a salon. Her body didn't seem to be reacting to the cold at all. No frostbite, no bluish tint, no shivering, not even one single goosebump. What really struck me about her was her eyes. Her eyes were an icy, cold looking blue, almost gray. She had no expression and despite having turned to me, she didn't seem to really notice that I was there. Her face and body language didn't indicate that she was actually acknowledging me. She never looked directly at me. I figured that she must really be on some serious drugs. I stopped for a second or two to think of what she might be on before remembering her current situation. Um, ma'am, are you alright? I repeated. No response. I can call a hospital for you if you need me to, I offered. At that point, I realized that I didn't bring my cell phone with me shit. What would I do now? I had no way of contacting authorities with this drugged up naked lady in the middle of the frozen woods, but I didn't feel comfortable just leaving her out here to go and get help. What if a search team wouldn't be able to find her in time? How long has she been out here anyways? I figured that my best option would be trying to get her to follow me back to town. Ma'am, would you like my coat? I offered. It was better than just letting her freeze, after all. She didn't react to my question at all, despite the cold. I took my coat off and began to approach her. That's when I noticed something I didn't notice before. Her fingers and toes now seemed to be a blue color. She didn't seem at all frostbitten not a moment ago. Where did that come from so fast? I knew I had to get her out of here, and fast. As I got closer, there was more frostbite I hadn't noticed before on her nose and ears. Suddenly, she turned away from me and began walking away. Hey, wait! I called out to her. No response. Suddenly, her pace quickened. A few seconds later, she was running. And a few seconds after that, she was out of sight. Damn it! I shouted. I would have to try to follow her footprints in the snow now, 
But that's when I noticed that she wasn't leaving any footprints. What the hell was going on here? A naked lady walking aimlessly in the middle of a Norwegian winter with randomly appearing frostbite and she wasn't leaving any footprints? Was she on drugs? Or was I? I thought about just turning back and trying to go back to town, but I still thought it would be better to find her and lead her back. I would just grab her and carry or drag her if necessary. I wasn't going to let this lady freeze to death while I could do something about it, even if she was apparently levitating. It was then at that point that I realized that I didn't know where I was. In my attempts to get to her, I had lost track of the trail. Well, now I felt stupid. My own footprints, I thought. I turned around and found that my footprints were also gone. My trail now just started where I was standing at the moment. Had the snow filled them in, or was I going crazy? I know for a fact though, that I wasn't levitating. It was at this revelation that I was becoming afraid. Something was seriously wrong here. What could I do now? I didn't know where the lady was anymore, and I didn't know how to get back to town, even if I did find her. This place is a big expanse of forest. It eventually extends back to a mountain range. Unfortunately, the trees were too thick to see the mountains for reference. Where the fuck was I? I could see one thing, however. The sun was starting to go down. The sun goes down pretty early around here. I guess it was a mistake to go out this late, since I figured I would have been home by now. I decided that all I could really do was just start walking the same direction I thought I had come from. I picked the direction that had been directly behind me when I lost sight of the woman. I figured that if I could find the trail, it would be easy. But I felt terrible leaving her that way. But I needed to know where the hell I was before I could effectively help her. I was now considering just rushing home and calling the authorities to be the best available option. But first, I needed a fine home. I walked for what felt like hours through snow and trees without ever finding a trail. I didn't know if my mind was playing tricks on me, similar to my footprints disappearing, or if I had actually gone in the wrong direction. I paused to look around when I noticed a woman walking off in the distance. Relative to where I was, she was at 3.30, about 20 yards away. I stared at her for a few seconds, realizing that she was actually looking at me. The fact that she was looking at me was creepier than when she wasn't. I was frozen in place, too confused to approach her. I knew I needed to help her, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to anymore. All of this seemed so off. She then began taking a few slow steps towards me to where I was. I don't know why, but I was getting scared now. I took a few steps back to attempt to match the ground she was gaining on me. She didn't seem determined to get to me. In fact, despite looking at me, she didn't seem like she actually noticed me. I was, for some reason, apprehensive to turn away from her and just run. I was still clinging to the idea that this was just some normal woman out of her mind on drugs who also needed my help. My own pace was beginning to slow down. I don't know why, but I wanted to get away from her for some reason. But my body just wasn't moving the way it should have been. On top of that, I was so cold, it was like ice was forming in my blood and she was catching up to me pretty quickly. Ma'am, if you need help, I can help you, I said. We can get back to town, lock a celeb. You know where that is, right? It's just on the outside of the woods here. Do you want me to help you? No response. I looked down and noticed that her hands and feet were frostbitten. There was also patches of frostbite all over her body now. Had her condition become more severe? When she got closer, the frostbite was also on her lips, turning them a blue color. Her chest and face 
were slowly becoming flushed in a frosty blue. Ma'am, your frostbite is getting worse. We need to get you to town. Here, take my coat, I said. I was actually becoming panicked at her bizarre behavior and this entire situation. There really was something severely wrong here. A large clump of snow fell from a branch above my head and crashed on my head. It didn't hurt, but I had to wipe the snow from my eyes. It took little effort getting it out. I looked up from my struggle to notice her now standing very close to me, nearly three feet away. That's when I lost it. I began to wheel myself away from her. I took off running, not caring which way I was heading anymore. As long as I could get away from that monster, that thing, she wasn't human. Or if she was, she wasn't a normal human. When I looked up at her that time, her body was completely covered in frostbite. Her entire skin was a deep blue color, patches of decay. Her forearms down and her legs on down were skeletal. Her face was mutilated by frostbite. Her ears and nose missing, the rims of her lips missing. Her chest was actually missing entirely with a large patch of mutilation carved into her chest by frostbite exposing just a small amount of her rib cage. I was just about out of my mind. I was actually running now. I had no idea where I would end up. I was just hoping to find the edge of the woods before she might have found me. I couldn't tell at all if I was getting closer to safety or further into the woods. Then I kind of wonder if just escaping the woods would be enough. Would she follow me out? I didn't know what to think anymore. That thing, obviously, wasn't human anymore, assuming it ever really was. So I didn't even know if it would conform to human logic. All I could do was cycle through begging not to be found, begging to escape somewhere else, begging to escape somewhere safe, cursing my entire decision to go walking out in the woods, cursing the woods themselves, asking what the hell she was, all of this. It was all I could do while running to avoid going crazy. I don't know what's going on, maybe it was making the whole thing worse. I ran for what must have been another few hours and it was dark now. As I was running, I tripped over a root, steered sideways and slammed my back into a tree. It was now too dark for me to see anything and I was now too tired to even move. If she were to find me, that's all there was to it. I would have to rest, build up some strength. I backed myself up against the tree I had collided with and stared into the blackness, hoping not to get attacked. I remember the food I brought with me and pulled out my bottle of water. All of the liquid had frozen solid. I found it very strange because I didn't really think it was cold enough for that to happen, especially since it had been in my coat pocket the entire time. Maybe. I was going crazy, or maybe I was just losing it. Well, I couldn't drink ice, so I moved on to the trail mix. It was fine and gave me a bit of strength. Stopping to eat actually gave me the chance to try to collect myself. I could really only wonder what the fuck that thing was. Why I was seeing so many weird things going on with the snow and ice. There had to be some kind of connection, but I wasn't about to approach any solid ideas as to what it was. As I sat in the dark, I could hear snow crunching somewhere. It was pitch black, but I could tell it was somewhere to my right. I was too exhausted to move now. All I could really do was sit against the tree and hope she didn't find me, or at least hope that whatever she would do to me wouldn't be too bad. But for some reason I doubted that. When I looked at her back then, she was looking at me for just a second. When I could see what she really was, that frostbitten body, her eyes stayed, but they were glazed over, like she was drugged or something. For just a second, she looked right at me. I can't even think of what she might have wanted to do to me, but I'm not really liking any of my options right now. As I sat there, listening to the distant crunching, I focused so intently 
I could feel every single snowflake that was hitting me. They seemed to be getting colder somehow. The entire forest seemed to be dropping in temperature. I honestly wasn't sure I would live to see her catch me. I might end up freezing first. I was trying to think that maybe I shouldn't just be sitting here. But I couldn't decide which was more dangerous. Walking around hoping not to be found. Or sitting in one spot hoping not to be found. I wasn't sure what to do either way. I looked behind the tree to still see nothing in the dark. I was pretty quickly darting my eyes and head around, desperately trying to get a visual on something, anything. I couldn't even see the tree I was leaning against. It must have been a new moon or something. I was so paranoid. I was pretty quickly losing track of time. I had no idea what time it might be, but things were starting to get blurry. At some point, I must have fallen asleep because out of nowhere, I opened my eyes to see broad daylight. In hindsight, I kind of wish I'd been able to stay awake. Even though nothing happened, something easily could have. In fact, whatever that thing was, seemed to have such a good grasp on the woods. I'm actually surprised she didn't find me. The only thing I can really think of is that she must have found me, but thought it would be too easy if I was sleeping when she did it. I looked to my right and saw footprints in the snow. Not a trail, just two footprints, side by side, like somebody was hovering over me, landed right there, and flew away. Was she watching me the entire night? Fuck that. I think that might actually be worse than if she caught me, cause now I know she's toying with me. I'm not sure if she considered me more prey or a toy, but I didn't like either option. Now that it was morning and I had rested. I decided I needed to start running again, trying to find the trail, the edge of the woods, anything. Honestly, I was sore as hell from all that running, but I guess I couldn't avoid more of it. I started off at a slow walk, keeping my eyes out for whatever that thing might be. This was a bit difficult, since I wanted desperately to just take off and run. I had to think about where I was going, instead of just sipping around blindly. I thought of looking for moss on trees, since I knew the woods were to the southeast of town. Conveniently, the trees had no moss at all, nor did the nearby rocks. I tried to think back on where the sun set last night, but I wasn't awake to see it rise, and I was running so blindly I didn't notice where it set. The sun was currently to my left, but I didn't know what time it was, or what direction that was. So that was worthless. I wish I was an expert tracker. I'm sure some hunter or navigator would be able to get me out of the woods. So now, I just had to walk, hoping I was going in the right direction. Hoping I wouldn't run into that thing again. I walked for a while, what had to be about two hours or so. I still didn't seem to be anywhere near the edge of the woods. I still couldn't see anything. It was mostly just a flat plain of snow with trees all around it. I kind of wish they had put a sign up at the edge of the woods, warning people not to go into it. Then again, I'm pretty sure a sign that said, warning, naked zombie lady, would be dismissed as a joke. At this point, I realized I was stupid and just ate a handful of snow. I completely forgot that snow was just fluffy water and just went without liquid because my water bottle was frozen. I must have been so confused from where I was exhausted that I didn't even think of it. With that refresher, I began to realize I was being followed again. I could hear the snow crunching from behind me again. I turned to face it, but there was nothing there. I gazed around, but still couldn't see anything. I needed to hurry up before that thing caught up to me, so I got up and kept moving. It was hours later, and I still didn't see any scenery that looked even remotely unique. I had no idea these woods were this big. I realized that nobody really knew me, so nobody would be looking for me either way. I wasn't really counting on that anyways. Honestly, I just needed to find a way out. At this rate, I wasn't sure if I was just walking in circles or not. 
I could have been for all I knew. At this point, I realized the sun was hanging low. That must have been west. I knew I needed to go northwest, so all I had to do was head in some direction from there. I didn't know where I would come out, but it was worth the shot, so I started walking. I walked for several more hours in what I assumed was a straight line. It didn't seem to be taking me anywhere. I looked up trying to focus on the sun, trying to see which way I was going. Around then, I turned around to see the path where I was coming from. That's when I saw her, the woman, standing directly across from me. She was far enough away that I couldn't see if there was any frostbite on her this time. She didn't look like it, but she was staring directly at me and walking towards me. I was in a better position this time, or at least I thought. I knew where the hell I was going. I turned left and started running towards the sun. I knew that there was a highway that went through a part of the woods. I wasn't so intent on getting to the highway as my definite destination. If she blocks my path directly to town, I can find some semblance of civilization. I ran for a few minutes before realizing that I had lost her, or at least it looked like I did. I wasn't sure anymore. I knew she could be anywhere. I slowed to a stop and surveyed my surroundings. I couldn't see her anywhere, nor any sign of her. A small amount of sunlight was peeking through the trees now, but I could tell it would most likely be setting within the hour. I had to find my way out before that happened, otherwise I would lose my only usable reference point. I took off running again, sprinting through the forest, dodging between trees. I had no idea how long I was running for, maybe 45 minutes but it was also getting darker. I was losing light and my ability to navigate. I could only try to keep running in a single direction and then just keep going that same way once the sun was down. I felt I had a pretty good system now. Surely, I couldn't get lost if I kept in a straight line. The only thing I really had to worry about was getting interrupted. At that point, I crashed into a tree. I had been running for hours I must have been tired again. My coat wasn't really protecting me from the environment the way it should have been also. As I slowly rose to my feet, I saw an opening in the trees. It was the trail. I had finally found it again. I climbed back to two feet and staggered onto it. I felt a lot better knowing I had found a sign that I was on the right track. I then realized I had something of a conundrum. Should I really follow the trail? Or should I keep going in a straight line, the way I was? I remember seeing a map of the trail outside. Seeing that it wasn't just one trail, but a huge network. I don't remember any specific directions. But I knew that just blindly following the trail might not necessarily be a good idea. Especially now that I was already on a good path. I decided the trail could screw itself and kept walking in a straight line. It was also very dark now. I could barely see. I couldn't quite move as quickly as I was before. But I wasn't about to just stop. I didn't trust my safety to that monster. It was now practically pitch black again. I didn't know what time it must have been. I had been switching between walking and running for more than 24 hours now. When the fuck would these woods end? These woods couldn't have been this expansive. They just couldn't have been. I must have been just completely lost at this point. I didn't know what to think at that point, and I still didn't know, to be honest. I was lost in thought, and then I realized the sun went down. The night wasn't quite as dark as the night before, but it was still nearly pitch black. I wouldn't just be running blindly anymore, so I kept walking straight. I felt in front of me for trees groping blindly like an idiot. I must have looked like one to that sadistic bitch. I went on grabbing at nothing for several hours. It had to be past midnight when I felt something that wasn't natural. I felt a quick brush of a wispy spiderweb-like form. It was hair. That woman's hair. That thing's hair. I stepped back for a second 
Looking around in the darkness, I couldn't see her anywhere. I could just barely make out the trees around me. I stood mostly blind, helpless against this monster in the dark. At this point, not being able to see her was worse than actually seeing her. That paranoia that grips you as a little kid in your bedroom, staring at the closet, waiting for the boogeyman to come out and eat you. I finally took a step, not feeling any sign of her anywhere. I kept taking a few very slow steps, trying to make some kind of headway. At this rate, I wasn't sure I would even notice if I was out of the woods or not. I could be standing in a field and I might not really notice. I debunked all of this when I felt the bark of a tree in front of me. I began maneuvering around it, keeping at its base to avoid losing my direction. As I rounded the trunk, I felt something. I felt two icy cold skeletal hands lightly caressed the sides of my neck. I felt what must have been whatever the fuck that thing was. Its shredded lips lightly kissed my ear. At that moment, I fucking lost it. I turned around, took a swing, hitting nothing, and turned back, taking off running. Kind of funny how quickly I abandoned my plan of just staying slow. I have no idea what the fuck that thing wanted, but it wouldn't be getting it from me. I sprinted through the woods, occasionally bumping into the edge of a tree, heading where I prayed, which was northwest. I was in a full panic, just barely keeping it together enough to remember where I was supposed to be going. It was a flashback to the night before, where I just ran blindly and got myself lost as I was. At least now, I could hope I had stayed in the right direction this time, but I wasn't banking on it. I had to avoid trees in the dark, hoping that lady wasn't behind me or in front of me. But that might be the thing that made me panic the most. The idea that I would just run right into her in the dark and never see her coming. I couldn't shake that feeling. I never felt like she wasn't right next to me. I knew she was always somewhere close by, watching me, waiting for whatever she wanted from me. At some point in the dark, I suddenly ran right into something. It was low and hard. It seemed to be a big rock. I felt one of my shin bones shatter on contact from how hard I was running, combined with the shape of it. I went flying over it, rode over the top of it, and landed in what seemed to be a collection of smaller rocks. I then started groping my way around before finding my footing. The rocks I was standing on were loose, so I ended up falling again. My hand landed just the right way for me to get an idea of the rock itself. It felt so strange. It actually didn't seem like stone. It was too light for that. I picked it up and felt its shape, discovering it to be a bone. I felt around a bit more and found that all of the small rocks I was laying on were actually bones, some of them clearly human. I began trying to crawl my way out before brushing my head on something metallic. I picked it up, finding it to be an old lighter. I gave it a few clicks to see if it worked. I have no idea if it did since I was terrible with lighters. I never could get one to light up as I sat there. I felt something brush against my leg. It was a hand. I jumped back, assuming it was her. As I backed away, I heard what I can only describe as a hoarse, weak, wheezing noise. I grabbed a large rock, crawling over it, attempting to rest for energy. I wasn't sure how well I could do with that busted leg bone. As I sat back, I could hear snow crunching from behind me. I listened carefully, trying to see exactly where it was coming from. How close was it? It was in the bone pile apparently. The footsteps suddenly stopped as I heard total silence for a few seconds. The wheezing kicked back, more panic sounding this time, like a person who had their vocal cords cut desperately trying to talk. I suddenly began hearing a different crunching noise. It sounded like bone breaking. It sounded like flesh tearing. I didn't know what was worse, what was happening, 
or what might be happening and not knowing was killing me. I had to know what it was. Curiosity was driving me crazy even though I dreaded what the answer to my question might be. Finally, I decided I had to see. I peeked over the rock, seeing nothing but darkness of course. But then I remembered the lighter. I gave it a few flicks before finally getting the damn thing to light. When I looked down, I saw her. I now saw the full scope of the bone pile. It was huge. It looked almost like one of those mass graves that genocides and massacres have been known to produce. There were some animal bones too. Deer, birds, dogs, but it seemed like it was mostly human bones. As I looked closely, I saw tooth marks on the bones. As I looked up, I saw exactly what she was doing. The exact source of that noise. It was a man. It looked to be a middle-aged man. Or at least what was left of him. His body was missing from around his stomach down. She was holding his torso up. Devouring him. She was biting off organs and flesh. Breaking bone with her teeth. Where it had once wore its disguise as a normal woman. Attempting to maintain a sort of dignity or beauty. All of it had been mostly been abandoned. Its mouth opened too wide mostly due to what seemed to be her cheeks missing as she tore off huge chunks of flesh like an animal. She then looked up at me, giving me a frigid look with those eyes. She glared at me, her female dignity returning. She stood, her mouth covered in frozen blood. The man seemed to be fading quickly. His body was blue from frostbite. I have no idea how he was still alive but he most likely wouldn't be for much longer. As she approached me, she took further notice of the lighter I carried. She seemed to shy away from me when she saw it, like she was afraid of it, but she still approached me, slowly, inching closer. As she approached, I realized what it was. Everything about her was cold. Her body was cold. Her home was cold. Her victims were cold. Her food was cold, so anything with heat must have been something she came deal with, as she was within arm's reach. I thrust the lighter at her. She quickly backed away before continuing her approach. I tried this a few more times before realizing that I was right. She couldn't stand heat. At this point, I had a crazy idea that I must have gotten from an action movie. I figured that if she was afraid or weakened by heat, I could set her on fire and possibly be done with her for good. As well as I could, I kept the lighter lit up and gently tossed it at her, reaching right into her hair. Her hair lightly catching a slight bit of fire before the lighter faded out onto the ground. I couldn't see what was happening, just embers coming from her, apparently burning her hair. I didn't want to stick around. This thing didn't seem to be very mortal. So I didn't want to risk the idea that I had only pissed it off. As best as I could with my busted up leg, I took off running, which actually wasn't very fast, more like limping away, but it was fast enough. I didn't see any really convincing signs that she was following me, but I'll never be sure. Everything after that is just kind of blurry. I have no clue how long I must have been running. It seemed almost like I must have fallen asleep while running because Suddenly, I was reaching the highway, staggering out onto the pavement and collapsing. At this point, I blacked out. What happened between then and when I woke up in the hospital was extremely fuzzy. I must have been picked up by somebody at some point, but I don't remember who they were or when they came along. What I do remember was coming to my senses for a few seconds in somebody's car, or it might have been the cab of a truck. The person asked me who I was, and I answered. They asked me what I was doing out in the woods, and what happened to me. For all I know, I blacked out again before I could answer. I woke up in the hospital in the afternoon. The doctors and police were asking me what happened to me. I didn't mention the bones, fearing that by doing so, I would end up sending some police officers to their death. 
I just told him that I had gone for a walk in the woods and became hopelessly lost. One officer asked me about the marks on my body. Apparently, when the woman touched me, she left marks of frostbite on my neck in the shape of skeletal hands. That's when I told them that I had no idea how that came to be. They didn't really seem to press the issue after that. I got home a few days later. I started my job a few days after that. I wasn't really that great in Norwegian, but had a passing knowledge of it. I asked a few co-workers about the woods, about that forest. An older guy told me about the woods being haunted by something, but he didn't really elaborate. And I don't think I really needed him to, since I knew all that I needed to know about it. On some occasions, I feel like I'm still sometimes back there. When I get a sudden chilly draft in my house, and the feeling that I'm being watched, even in the summer, even after I have moved out the country, which once again for work, the frostbite she left on my neck left a very visible scar. It still does hurt a little bit, especially on cold snowy days. I don't recommend ever going there, not even for a second. I don't know what that thing was, where she came from, or if she even survived my attack. I was lucky to have gone in a way because I know that if I hadn't found that lighter, I would most likely have ended up the same as that guy. I do still warn you though that if you ever do decide to go, I can't promise that you'll do any better than I did. And to all the men out there, if you ever see a naked woman out in the woods, don't ever approach her. As a matter of fact, run. Turn the other way and run opposite of her as fast as you can.